The next area I'd like to briefly say something about uh, is what's referred to as investment in U.S. property. When we look at our usual situation of uh, U.S. parent uh, owning a CFC, uh, let's think back to what we spoke about uh, last week when we talked about previously taxed income. We said that to the extent that there is a subpart F inclusion up here, to the extent there is an inclusion at the U.S. company level, that creates, to the extent we don't, of course, move the money back, uh, to the ex I'm sorry, let's uh, start over. Uh, if we have a hundred of uh, subpart F income over here, and if we, as a result, the U.S. shareholder recognizes that hundred of, uh, of income within its tax return as a subpart F inclusion, that 100 creates a previously taxed income account so that in the future, when the CFC pays an actual dividend, it will be treated for U.S. purposes not as a dividend because all we're doing is paying to the U.S. an amount that they've already recognized as income. This previously taxed income approach prevents double counting. And why, why code section is this one under? This is 959. The reason I bring this up again is that we said the CFC had 100 of previously taxed income. But let's say its actual income uh, in this year when it had a hundred of subpart F. Let's, we're, we're just looking at one taxable year for simplicity. Uh, the 100 was not its only income. It also had, let's say, 200 of income which was not subpart F income. So you'd say, gee, it had a total of 300 in that year but only 100 of it was subpart F income that created uh, this previously taxed income account. So what is the 200? We could call the 200, let's say, other earnings and profits. Now, under deferral, uh, under deferral, this 200 would just remain untaxed by the U.S until a dividend is paid out of it. Under the ordering rules in 959, when if a dividend of 100 were paid, it comes first out of the PTI account. And as you'll see from information on the companies that you're doing the project on, gee, surprisingly, they've left all these earnings, often just cash in the bank, uh, in the CFCs. They have not brought it back to the United States. Why? Well, to, uh, to uh, paraphrase uh, Tim Cook, gee, it's not a very smart thing to do. They, you know, the U.S. would tax it. So, uh, well, I mean, uh, if uh, one of the things that I couldn't help but noticing uh, when I looked at Apple's uh, uh, Form 10-K for uh, the year ended uh, September 2017 was that they had roughly $250 billion of cash sitting outside the United States that uh, would be taxed if they brought it back. So, you know, it's not, a, uh, it's not rocket science to understand why they left all this cash out there. Prior to the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, this 200 of other E&P had to be left out outside the United States. But, of course, companies see all this cash out there and they say, well, gee, how can I use it uh, somehow, uh, you know, how can I use it? 
Now, if you go through the slides, uh, and the slides were uh, slides number, uh, let's see, slides 32 to 35. If you go through those slides, you'll see what acceptable uses there are and what non-acceptable uses were, uh, or are, I should say. I mean, for example, if the CFC made a loan to the U.S. parent, if the U.S. parent has the use of the money, isn't that sort of the equivalent of a dividend, you know, within this controlled group where it doesn't matter whether the money, which pocket did I put it in? I think it's down here. Put it back up here. You know, so the rules say, well, gee, if, it, if the CFC loans to the U.S. parent, that'll be treated as a dividend and a subpart F inclusion, effectively. Now, under the new tax rules, as we'll eventually get to, the 200 of other E&P uh, will have the participation exemption uh, because we have this new territorial system. For a U.S. parent company today and going forward, this is not such a big issue. And in fact, there are proposed regulations under Section 956 that say that for most practical purposes, the U.S. parent doesn't have to worry about any further tax on that 200. But as I think I've uh, commented once or twice, if we have, let's say, an individual who was the owner of this CFC, and again, we'll get into more details uh, very quickly, that individual is does not get the benefit of the participation exemption. That individual will be fully taxable on any dividend out of that 200 of other E&P. So these 956 rules, which I'm suggesting you, you know, look through uh, uh, those uh, four or five slides uh, to see something on, those investment in U.S. property rules still fully apply to any U.S. shareholders that are individuals, that are not corporations. Could you repeat that, Nathan? 956, the investment in U.S. property rules, will still be fully applicable for U.S. shareholders, again, 10% or greater uh, U.S. persons, it will still be applicable to any individuals or other non-corporate U.S. shareholders of CFCs. So in the typical situation where we're talking about a group with a U.S. parent company, 956 is now normally not so relevant. But for an individual, it's very, very relevant. Uh, one more comment, and then we'll go on to the, uh, uh, the uh, next topic. Uh, what if, let's say our uh, individual up here, let's say that uh, he has his friendly banker down the block, and he takes a loan and says, gee, uh, in order to get a lower interest rate, I will have the CFC give a guarantee. A guarantee is just as bad as if the CFC had loaned directly to the individual. Uh, I can certainly say, uh, uh, looking back, that this is the kind of thing that people get in trouble with. Uh, they take loans, they don't ask, you know, their friendly tax advisor at the time they do this, but it can have a tremendously detrimental tax effect. Are you going to the detail of, of that? The point is that the term, uh, again, I, I haven't gone into the details of 
what are the categories of investment in U.S. property, but if the CFC uh, loans money to the shareholder, if the CFC buys, uh, uh, buys shares of a company in the U.S. which uh, is a 25% or greater owner of the CFC, um, if the CFC buys in, uh, intellectual property that is used in a business inside the United States, that's a, a bad thing. Uh, there's a long listing of these kinds of things. One of the specific rules is that if the CFC makes a guarantee or loan of the obligation of a U.S. person, then that will be considered an investment in U.S. property. My experience is that I've found this kind of problem, uh, sadly, after the fact, you know, long, you know, it's, for example, again, I was in an accounting firm for many years, and one of the things I occasionally did was to, uh, uh, to sign off on the tax issues with respect to uh, the financial statements of a company. Well, you know, you read through the footnotes, you read through uh, various documents, and you, you see that, well, gee, <laughs> you know, this foreign subsidiary has made a, uh, a guarantee, uh, has issued a guarantee, because it's listed in, uh, uh, in uh, various obligations that they have to be disclosed. So you find out about it long after it's too late to do anything about it.